So welcome, thank you for joining us this afternoon. The reason we're here, the, the one thing that unites us all is that whatever our role, whatever our organization, we all face the same imperative. There's a lot to do and it needs doing quicker. And unless you're from the oil rich nations, we need to execute with ever decreasing budgets and to higher standards. And that's our professional challenge here today and in our careers. What we're going to do in this session is we're going to address that challenge in three ways. We're going to look at examples from our experience, we're going to look at some research, and we have some of our own thought leadership on the topic as well. To get the most value out of this session back into your workplaces and into your careers, we invite you to consider three questions. Question one, why? What, are you absolutely clear about why you're doing something? what you expect out of the end, whether it's deliverables or benefits. Question two, what? What really matters? So are you interested in capex burn rate or are you interested in speed to value? And we'll explain these concepts as we go through. And question three, how? How are you prepared to invest to accelerate your return on investment? We're going to offer some short-term and some long-term options for where to target your efforts in order to get projects delivering at pace. We've also given you all a check sheet. If you don't have a check sheet, you stick your hands up and Claire will, will nip around and give you guys some check sheets. But the check sheet will allow you to conduct for your uh, self-evaluation of how well structured you or your organization is in delivering projects at pace. It will give you some insights into some of the things you can do to get pacier and you can use it in conjunction with the session we're going to go through which will explain some of the concepts on the check sheet. We're going to present all of our thoughts as a dichotomy between the traditional action-oriented response that generates speed but not pace, and the response you need if you're going to deliver projects at pace. In order to do that, we first need to define speed and pace. So speed and pace are often mis mistaken for each other, and yet I suggest that the two, in fact, are very, very different things. Uh, I'm almost afraid to raise this as a topic of conversation um, but for me, possibly one of the most memorable, if not painful, examples of the distinction between speed and pace came in New Zealand's America's Cup Challenge. Um, do you remember that? It was kind of like Groundhog Day, um, a, a version of the Melbourne sweepstake. And by the way, I mean the nation found itself day after day in front of a screen somewhere, anywhere, probably your own workplaces, um, to witness a sporting spectacle and a piece of history in the making. And in that process, those of us that followed it had burned into our memories the importance of getting to the mark first. Remember that? Yep. Um, and then more significantly to the finishing line. And then, of course, ultimately to doing that nine times faster than the other guy. Yep. Um, simply sailing by itself didn't cut it. What really mattered was, was in their language, velocity made good. And we had the animations to explain that, which is what we're now referring to as pace. So to summarize that distinction Phil opened up with, speed is simply how fast you're moving, period. Pace, velocity made good in sailing terms, how fast you're actually progressing towards your goal. Right. So back to the America's Cup. The benefits of that to the winner and their nation were huge. The pace at which that value is generated throughout the entire campaign, um, and race by race, both of those are measurably more significant and speed over the water at any one time. I'm sure you'll agree. And the same definition holds true in your projects. A project that moves slower, but in the most direct way towards the objective, achieves a greater pace than a project that plows along at remarkable speed, but doesn't get anything done or does things in an unoptimal way. And that's the distinction we're using between speed and pace. Picking a real life example, to, to put it into context, Great speed was shown by the organization that needed to install a server, but couldn't define what the server needed to do or what specification or what configuration was required from the server. The, the mantra was, there's not enough time to figure it out, just get on with it. Of course, the server wasn't configured as required, and it needed reconfiguring, and reconfiguring again, and again and a fifth time just for good measure. After five reconfigurations of the server, it met the, uh, the requirement of the day. The speed of that task was exceptional. The pace of that task was woeful. So that's the distinction we're trying to make between speed and pace. So pace is the amount of time it takes to travel a 
a set distance towards the objective. On a business owner terms or an investor's terms, burning project capital too quickly is speed to an escalation for more money, not speed to value. So using that dichotomy, let's go back and look at that first why question. Are you absolutely clear about why you're doing something? It's our contention that pace can be designed into a project right from this initial thought processing stage. So just think for a moment in your own workplaces and in your own experience, and just answer to yourselves rather than to out loud, uh, just how often do you see that enthusiasm to put up a business case in order to secure project funding so that the project can get on with delivery? Common enough? If that's the, oh, some nods, thank you. So on that basis, the speed response is that the business case is a necessary hurdle to be taken over, uh, taken through as quickly as possible so that the funding can be approved and we can get on with delivering our projects. Fair enough. The pace response is that the business case is there so that all parties have clarity, alignment, and agreement on what is to be accomplished, how it's to be accomplished, what the benefits it will deliver to the organization, and how it measures the, meets the strategic objectives of your organization. Very different mindset. The second question that we'd ask is, having got the business case approved, whichever way you approached it, next question would be, so how prevalent is that pressure to deliver, which case kind of ends up in descoping features and or project benefits in order to minimize cost overruns or hit a movable go live dates? Do we identify with that as something that we see in our organizations past or present? Yeah. So the speed response, of course, is that the dates must be delivered at all costs and everything else is changeable. The pace response this problem doesn't occur because projects are fundamentally different and, neg and they negate that tension. So we were saying earlier, speed to market is replaced by speed to value. So we really want to stress the importance of clarity of thinking here. Uh, to the project manager, the business case might be the request for funding. To a business owner, it needs to be a promise to deliver a benefit from the investment in time, money, resources. So we suggest that that lack of clarity and agreement is a predictor of a project that will take longer than forecast to deliver and even longer than forecast to realize any benefits, if at all. So the emergence of some maturing thinking and practice in this, in this regard is really helping us starting to deliver pace in our projects. And I'm referring to better business cases and supported by investment logic mapping as, as emerging now in the public sector. So... <clears throat> It's imperative using that language that the business owners and project managers understand, and I quote their phrases, what problem we're trying to solve, what are the benefits of solving it, what strategic options do we have for approaching the solution, what changes do we make, need to make, which is your likely OPEX, and what assets do we need to create, which is your likely CAPEX. So done well, as reported in the origins of this, the Victoria State Government, the number of bids for funding goes down, along with the combined cost of preparing them, and the success rate of the remaining true business cases goes up. So our pace, the amount of effort we need to expend to reach our objectives, is seriously reduced when we are not clear about what we are trying to do. So to get pace, first install these disciplines into your organizations if you haven't already. So now we have an understanding about what we're trying to do in our project, and we're focused on pace, not speed, from the outset. The remainder of this session is devoted to how to get pace in that execution phase of a project. We're going to look at tool sets and skill sets and mindsets. We want to generate thinking and options for you to take away into, into your organizations that are fit for your purpose. First concept is size does matter and think small. Smaller things have more pace. Smaller things are more likely to be successful. The, the chaos report, which is a report published every few years by the Standish Group, says that small projects have a 70% chance of delivering to the time and cost and quality constraints, large projects almost none. Where you can, my recommendation, stop doing large projects. Break them into a series of small projects and run them all independently. And the key here is to run them all independently. Preface this with an example. Take the example of upgrading to window, upgrading from Windows XP, which is something many people in the room have had experience that one way or another. This project's got many constituent parts, and I want to focus on two. The deliverable one is to remediate applications. 
So we need to, in order to remove XP, we have to have applications that work in a Windows 7 or Windows 8 environment. That's one of the deliverables. A second deliverable is to deploy new operating systems to the, the estate out there, whether it's laptops or desktops or whatever. The speed response, and the way most people run this sort of project, is to run those two deliverables in parallel. Because that gets the project done quicker doing things in parallel. The reality is that the pace response is to run them both as independent projects in sequence, not in parallel. Because the reality is when an application isn't remediated by your fictitious deployment date you set yourself, the pressure comes to deploy anyway. And then you end up deploying in a non-optimal fashion because you can't deploy according to your original schedule, you recut your schedule, you recut it again when you miss the next date, you recut it again when you miss the next date. And all of that replanning doesn't get you any closer to your objective. You're burning lots of effort and moving no closer to your objective whatsoever. Your pace is diminishing. Speed might be good, but your pace is diminishing. So we think a single common goal, which single projects generally have, encourages pace and encourage you to break your projects down into, into individual, um, individual projects. Don't confuse, though, the breaking up of projects into milestones or phases or critical paths with breaking large projects into small projects. Deliverable of a concrete and usable result demarks a successfully completed small project. So next, how we'd like to introduce is the idea of removing wait states or bottlenecks. It's a truism, I know, but you'll only move at the speed of your slowest process, right? So if you can work out where your bottlenecks are, then remove them. And in this regard, we've been really impressed with some organizations, possibly represented here today, um, that use bus standard business process improvement methods on their project management delivery methodology. So that's incremental change of how you do step change. Right. Brilliant. Um, so let's look at an example. Many organizations might have a requirement for change approval before the changes are made to production systems. Uh, those changes might need to go to an architectural review board, some form of pre-change approval board, a design authority, if you will, and then for a final one. Nothing wrong with that process, except that each of those might wait on a Wednesday, and in order to get through all three of them in sequence, you're taking three weeks on every single project that you're doing it. Yep. So uh, the other thing that I hear, some organizations say, ah, yes, so we run out of cycle meetings to do that, uh, which is a speed response, if you like. Um, because it actually means you halve your pace, you have to have had more meetings to go back and relitigate what was previously discussed. All right, so instead, simply design out the wait states, which is, if you like, a uh, more permanent fix. So speed response might be to plan carefully and make sure you allow for the approval time and get them first time, that's good. Pace response is to change the system so that you don't have to go through that cycle time so quickly, so slowly. There are countless opportunities of building those processes in most, into most organizations to take those um, bottlenecks out of the system. But when you can find them, identify them, and remove them. Okay, our next concept is to, to simplify things. Simple things achieve more pace. It was Einstein who first said, any fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. So let's be courageous. And let's look at ways of simplifying what we do so that we can deliver more pace. A couple of concepts under the heading of simplify. The first being under-engineer. In countless studies, it has been proven that for software, 20% of the features get used 80% of the time. 50% of the features get used 20% of the time. And I think that's generous. I think 50% probably never get used. So let's start delivering projects with fewer features. They're easier to do. We'll achieve more pace. And nobody uses half of what we build anyway, so why build it in the first place? To put that into an example again, take Microsoft Word, an application that lots of us use frequently. Word 2007 had a feature count of 1,264 features. A word processor, 1,264 features. That means 80% of us, according to the, uh, the, the logic, use 252 of those features frequently. I think it's probably a lot lower. So even organizations like Microsoft, way too feature rich, we don't use them. So let's start simplifying by actually using less features. One technique you can use to, to help you do this is the, the V model for requirements. In, in the V model, you start at the top left with clarity around your objective. What are you trying to achieve? And that talks back to what Brian mentioned right at the start. Then those objectives are broken down into 
more and more refined sub subsets where each time you come to a subset, you ask yourself the question, is everything I'm listing in this subset 100% genuinely required in order to achieve the step above? And if it isn't, it doesn't make the list. And by having that, you force yourself to under-engineer because you only put objectives into your requirements that actually deliver the final objective you're trying to reach. It's a really powerful tool. It's not something I see widely used, and it, it does make a, a huge difference. The, gen, the generic speed response is to ask the user for their requirements and then just get busy doing whatever the user asks you to do. The pace response is reduce the requirement because there's um, not a need for it a lot of the time. It's also important to remember to do the simplest possible thing you can to achieve the objective. And an example from my experience to serve as a warning. I was working with a, a global pharmaceutical company, and they wanted to deliver reporting to their frontline sales reps. And these reports would show which drugs had been sold in the past day and what, the, what was making the drug sell. What, what was a hook that was getting somebody to buy a particular drug? Was it a particular disease in a particular location? Was it a particular remedy? What was the hook? The benefit for the salesperson would be great because they'd have more tools to go and sell more effectively. The benefit for the organization would be great because the sales are expected to increase by hundreds of millions of dollars implementing this sort of system. So a project was started in a typical speed response project. We need to build a global data warehouse to get all the information together first, so let's go build a global data warehouse. Problem is, all of the information is stored across 46 different countries in 20 different systems. And those systems don't speak the same language. So what's called a, an aspirin in one system is not called an aspirin in the next system. So what happens next is 20 different projects spring up to make sure that all the systems can talk to each other and have the same taxonomy and, and are doing the same things. Halfway through the project, the advent of the iPad came out. And somebody said, well, we ought to make sure we push all the data daily to the iPads because all our sales teams are going to have iPads in the future, so let's push all the data to the iPads. And then they realized that actually the quantity of data they wanted to push to the iPad made that unreasonable. So they started another project to work out how to rationalize a data set and compress a data set to get to the iPad. Three years into the project, 215 million US dollars spent not a single report delivered to a single user. That's the speed response. The pace response is to say for $215 million, you can employ 290 people full time for 25 years. You can stick them in a room, you can give them Excel, and they can do some number crunching, and they can email the reps a spreadsheet that tells them what they need to know. The advantage of that is it's going to last 25 years, which the technology solution wouldn't and it can start delivering a benefit tomorrow. So that's, think of doing the simplest possible thing you can. We, we all actually don't. We're all guilty of that, but we have to remind ourselves to, to do the simplest thing we can. To continue on that theme, don't spend longer on negotiating a project than doing a project as well. So the speed response is to fight for every project, perfect the 30-page business case, have it reviewed in triplicate, talk about it every steering group and every governance group. The pace response, for the right small projects, is don't spend weeks developing a business case. A good two-page business case is fine for a small project. Make sure that you're not talking about it in all the steering groups and governments, which are applying the right level of process to it, not just the process, because that's what we do. And try going to one less project meeting this week. Your project might be better for it. <laughs> right. So to continue on with the example that Phil's just shared, uh, perhaps we should be trying to have a kill switch. Let me explain. Speed response to that kind of project is to continue working hard to deliver it, trying to meet time scales, quality expectations, functional list, etc., with ever decreasing budget, no matter what. So the pace response is to have a definition agreed up front, which, if met, would cause you to actually stop the project. Key point here. No pace is achieved by working on a project which never delivers any value. So let me ask, and again, it's kind of a rhetorical question. You don't need to say it out loud. But when was the last time when somebody in your organization got a bonus for stopping something? So I haven't experienced it yet. Well, they kind of morph and take up version two, version three. So possibly never. But we've all seen or been involved in projects that we knew needed stopping. So have a kill switch. Whether this is a minimum set of benefits that must have, must have to be or have been delivered uh, or a maximum amount of time or money that can be spent on the project, defining that up front 
will give you the parameters that you can use when the project must, must end. Once outside those, stop it. So the result of that approach is that you end up stopping projects when they should be. You do less project work. You'll have more money, more time, more energy, and more resources for doing the things that will deliver the benefits of the projects that you run. If you're using the cheat sheet, you'll be already be able to answer some of those questions in your organization in terms of delivering lots of these initial concepts. Right. So let me move on to that piece of short thought leadership that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and I've just phrased this little piece called myth-busting some triangles. Yep. Traditional project management control, thinking and practice, is often based on the concept of managing with three controls. Right? Pick two and then fix the third, like iron, yep. and then flex the other one. So you're probably familiar with these two versions, traditional approach, um, time, cost, and quality, pick two out of three, and project managed by change request. Yep. The, perhaps the more modern approach, if you like to call it that, um, is to fix time and cost and then release features iteratively until time and budget run out, in which case you're project managing by iterative release, yep. okay. application and so on. But in both cases, we suggest there's an inherent assumption that productivity is a constant throughout the life of the project. In other words, you can't improve while you're doing things. That's why you have to manage within the triangles. And we put it to you, that assumption is it patently not correct. And in fact, it's a myth understanding, if you'll pardon the choice of the phrase. But that myth I've seen personally busted in civil engineering, where projects were awarded on a fixed time, fixed cost, and fixed quality basis, and a successful vendor backed themselves to make a profit over a three-year project based on productivity improvements throughout the life of the project, and they had the means for doing that. Very competitive environment, and it worked. Next technique. Consider embedding learning. Let me explain what I mean. If we see traditional lessons learned post-implementation reviews at the ends of projects, cannot by definition improve the product productivity of the project that's just been reviewed. So one practical tool is to improve productivity is to embed lessons learned in real time. And we're passionately supporting the emergence of embedding lessons learned while the project is in flight as a step forward in our project management maturity. Some organizations are doing this already. In Agile, you might refer to it as retrospectives at the end of sprints. Uh, but whatever your practice, uh, it's a very worthwhile productivity tool to have in your kit and will increase the paces of your project. Equally important when you do those lessons learned at the project level is to escalate those issues which are beyond the realm of any one project so they can be dealt with at the next appropriate level. So for example, no one, no one project that relies on an ad inadequate end-to-end -end test environment can deal with that, but others can if it gets escalated. So then even another way to work with that concept to improve productivity is to learn lessons from previous projects and carry them over to the next project. It's a very mature practice indeed where the learnings from one project actually translate into productivity and gains in another. The existence of a, of a repository is where lessons learned go to die. It's a much more dynamic process than that. So the speed response is to run lessons learned when the projects are finished. The pace response is to embed lessons learned throughout the projects and across your portfolio. You will know you're succeeding when, when doing that when the nature of lessons learned changes over time because you've designed them out. Okay, okay sticking with the concept of triangles, there's, there's a new triangle in the world of projects. Second generation triangles, if you like. And, and these triangles are different. They're different in what are at the axes, and they're different in the relationships between the axes. Our three axes are pace, transparency, and collaboration. The difference in the relationship between them is that unlike in first generation triangles, where you could only fix two of the axes, in second generation triangles, you can't achieve any of them unless you achieve all three. So to put that in context of pace, you can't achieve pace, <coughs> excuse me. You can't achieve pace if you don't have transparency, and you can't achieve pace if you don't have collaboration. This means we need to work in different ways. We need to start doing some new things, and we need to stop doing some of the old things. We need to stop hiding the complexity of what we know needs doing, just so the business case gets approved. We need to stop assuming our vendors are going to assume risk, just so we get the right price, because they slow pace. We need to stop giving problems to our project teams and saying it's your problem, you solve it. 
that reduces pace. We need to start doing some new things. We need to start defining objectives we're trying to achieve and allowing everybody to have a contribution to the objective and, and working out what the right solution is. We need to be open about our constraints and our challenges that, and that we have in order to deliver our objective. These will deliver pace. To give you an example again, poor pace was shown by the organization that described a set of tasks that needed performing on their active directory implementation. They gave these set of tasks to their project team. Their project team went well and diligently performed the tasks. But the end user wasn't happy because PC login times hadn't been reduced to 30 seconds. This objective of getting PC login, login times down to 30 seconds had never been discussed with the project team. It was, it was news to them. Had they known this, they would have performed a very different set of actions, a very different set of tasks. They would have got PC login times down to 30 seconds and spent half the amount of money that they actually spent on a task they were asked to perform. That's a real live example from Wellington, and that was in the last three months. So this sort of stuff happens. Um, the check sheet, check sheet that some of you have has questions about transparency and collaboration, and you can now got some context to, to answer those uh, transparency and collaboration questions. Okay. Let me just check on our time key here. We may need to do an iterative release of the remainder of this program. How long have we got? <laughs> 13 in total. Oh, thank you. I saw the yellow and I thought that's fine. <laughs> so, pace to check. Uh, so, the, 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 the next, and I guess this is what Brian and I have just been doing, making decisions slower. Um, an important element to control and to achieve more pace is the time between identification of a decision and the actual resolution of that decision. And the, the pace response is you've got to shorten that time. A decision needs making, you've got to make it now. The, the pace response is actually the opposite. And you, you shouldn't make a decision until the absolute possible latest time that you're allowed to make that decision. You shouldn't even try to make a decision until that latest possible time. A number of things you can do to help you do that. So you can have a decision-making framework that allows decisions to be made quickly, that has transparent, delegated levels of authority. Who's going to make a decision that, that has this risk profile or this cost profile? And actually have those published. Can decisions get made quicker? And secondly, you can um, make sure you make them at the, the last responsible time. So I'll give you an example again that's from, from Wellington of replacing hardware. So you replace your desktops and your laptops on a three or four year refresh program. And the standard way I see of doing this is for the project manager to turn up and say, so what models of hardware are you rolling out? There you go, decision. First thing they want to know is a decision. You don't need to answer that question on day one. Because on day one, you can go and say which users are replacing and go to those users and say what applications are you running, what are your memory requirements, what are your screen requirements, what are your size and weight requirements for your laptop and get all the information. And then you can start to plan your deployment schedule. And then you can go to the group and say what laptops would you like to buy. And then they've got all that extra information that they can use to make decision once rather than make it seven or eight times and to make the decision stick. And by making the decision once and spending a small amount of time on it, we achieve more pace. So thinking now about both those with the hard process skills, the next piece of this presentation is to think about using the soft skills and more specifically to invest in those up front, again, to achieve pace. So do you remember in our opening remarks where they asked that question if there's just that natural tendency to get on with it? And often that positive drive to design and deliver to speed means we discount the upfront effort in, into the soft skills called pace. Any time that the, you want to do some form of team building at the front end of a, of a, of a project, often is met with, no time for that, let's just get on with it. In other words, the time that we talked about that earlier. Um, there was a recent example shared with me when the upfront investment in one team um, in the compact round the world race, yacht race, a while back. All the boats were um, racing or identical. All the crews were novice sailors. They actually paid about 28K each to join it. Each had a competent skipper. All but one team prepared simply by practicing sailing. One team invested in teamwork up front. And simply put, they needed to know how they would perform individually and collectively before they struck the challenges of the, the, the southern seas, slip, deprivation, gear failure, and so on. Needless to say, the, the investment paid off on the water. So what I've been doing in the previous lives, the current one, is helping project leadership teams invest in their own development as a team in providing group process observation and feedback on steering committees uh, and the like. Uh, to, if you like, front load their performance over time. So this graphic is simply indicating that if you can invest in the leadership team up front, you'll end up going from one trajectory with a high emphasis on speed 
to the higher one, which is much more high delivering on pace. It seems to me a complete and utter shame that the highest performing moment that a team is, achieves is the day it disbands. The opportunity cost is enormous. Yep. Okay. Another example of working with teams has um, been based on the work of um, Stephen M. R. Covey, son of his father Stephen Covey, in the speed of trust, if any of you have heard of that. And his basic proposition on the screen at the moment is if trust is low, speed is low, and cost is high. And he refers to that as a trust tax, whereas if trust is high, speed is high, and cost comes down, he calls that a trust dividend. It's worth pointing out that these are copyrighted terms. His version of speed, we were actually referring to as pace. Uh, we're not going to violate the copyright in the process. So. <coughs> Last couple to finish off. Um, think about understanding what limiting resistance might mean. So by that I mean you can get more speed by applying more pressure. Again, that question I asked earlier, but you're not likely to get more pace. If I can put it to you this way in the, in the sailing analogy, there's a limiting of resistance to the speed of change within the organisation. Think of it as a bow wave. Right? It doesn't much matter much how hard you push the engine, the bow wave that you create by doing that simply creates extra resistance force. So think about that, the organisation resisting that amount of change coming at them for so long. Yep. So delivering projects at pace simply means taking people affected by the project-led change with you, not imposing change on them and hoping you can get it through the warranty period. Right? So there's change management approaches associated with doing that. Okay, final point to increase the pace on your projects is to check often and, if necessary, fail quickly. So going back to our uh, America's Cup example we've used throughout, we're on our boat, it's achieving phenomenal speed, we're, we're racing hard, we're going faster than we've ever gone before, and we have a decision point. Do we put all of our efforts for the next few minutes into trying to keep that pace going or maybe even go a little bit faster, or do we stop? put our head up, and check we're still going in the right direction. And it sounds a little bit funny, but we do that on our projects all the time. We just pace speed, 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 and we don't put our head up often and check we're going in the right direction. So our challenge to you is to check often. Make sure you've got the review meetings, the governance meetings, the steering group meetings in and got them planned, and make sure they're being effective and they're being active. Don't think of them as extra cost. Think of them as a way of checking that you're actually heading in the right direction because speed without pace is, is just a waste, and the governance will, will get your pace right. A very quick example to that, there's a, a small software development company called 37 Signals. Some of you may or may not know of them. There, there are 17 people who make up 37 Signals. They live on six different countries, and they've never met face to face. And they have a, a process by which everything they do can take a maximum of two weeks, and can have a maximum of one person working on it. That's their rules. Every two weeks, somebody else who wasn't working on a project checks it, checks what's been done, and does a retrospective. What lessons did you learn? What was good? What was bad? What can we all learn going forward? And shares those results with the 16 other people. So you can say they check every 10 man days worth of effort that they're going in the right direction. The result of that is uh, 37 Signals are one of the most profitable software development companies in the world. So the 17 of them, they make 20 million US dollars every month per product set, and they have three product sets. 17 very, very rich people out there, because you know what? Pace pays. So is that the base camp license agreements that everybody's with? It is, yeah. Good. All right. So I just want to summarize now in terms of um, how we've set this up, what we've offered, where we've got to. Um, we realize we've delivered a long list of questions and practical suggestions that you can use to increase the pace in your projects. So by reviewing those, we asked those opening questions about clarity around the why, the what, and the how. We opened up that dichotomy, if I can use that phrase, around the difference, the distinction between speed and pace, and applied that throughout the entire presentation and related that to the check sheet that you've got with you so that you've got some anchor from this conversation into how you might choose to use that in your own works. So we, as Phil set up, we introduced things to do with skill set on that table, things to do with tool sets, and perhaps more importantly from a personal passion perspective, Mindset ones. They're the ones that unlock the productivity of the other two. Yep. So the suggestion is that there's opportunities aplenty to deliver your projects at pace at each of those. We've challenged you to think about it at the start. Which ones you take on now, it's entirely over to you. That's your fit for purpose adaptation of those. 
We certainly hope that the value that you take from this paper will not only benefit your own workplaces, but in your careers and in our profession as well. Um, in terms of that transparency and collaboration, I just, in closing, just want to thank Phil for the opportunity to develop this presentation with you. We've done iterative releases up until hmm, 10 o'clock last night, a little bit this morning. <laughs> We're walking our own talk, I can tell you that that's in practice. And, and I must say that if we ha you have as much fun as we have had in preparing this and sharing it with you, you'll have a ball. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Um, referring to the Oracle Team New Zealand situation, um, Team New Zealand came within five minutes of winning the cup um, and failed. And from that point on, the boat never quite reached the same speed and Oracle's improved a little bit. Mm. The disappointment of that situation had a significant impact on the team. What sort of soft skills would have helped them to overcome that type of disappointment? And what are the lessons we can learn in projects they get so close to the finishing line mm. and then stumbles and don't yeah, deliver. Yeah. Understood the question, feel your pain, feel I need to refer to a clinical psychologist for advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's truly not my professional field uh, in terms of high performance sports coaching and the like. Um, the significance of that, I think, was in front of our um, faces of Dean Barker, Dalton, for years to come. In all fairness, beyond my realm of professional expertise to take it further than that. In terms of how the process of lessons learned and applying from that, I cannot help but believe that they were doing continuous improvement in real time, even to the point of redesigning holes and building, making modifications in real time. Classic example of the approach, the psychological impacts of what you've just said are enormous. But if you look at, at other sports, you, you see the same effect. So I'm, um, I'm obviously British and I'm a big soccer follower, as we all are over in the UK. And, and what, I, um, what I see... Uh, the teams where they lose confidence in, in the manager or the coach and the team who was performing really well goes on a constant slide of losing, 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 losing. And it affects them around and the team start playing worse than actually they should because there are talented players there. And what they do is they change the coach. They get rid of the head man. They, they actually keep 99% of the players exactly the same and change the coach. And overnight, their performance sort of becomes brilliant again because there seems to be some sort of association of you, your leadership or your... your uh, direction has caused this problem for us and if you go there's a weight lifted so maybe mm. they should have changed the coach watch out project managers <laughs> you see it on projects it's a very good analogy <laughs> well thank you very much for that I can uh, tell you that I'm going to turn my project management vision inside out a little after today that's great thank you very much and we um, often put a lot of projects together and make a huge project where I work so I'm really looking forward to breaking that all down yeah thank you very